Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, I am teaching on a very important subject which I have titled Bible Simple Truth about standing on the promises of God. What are the necessary tools needed to stand on the promises of God? Can we trust the promises of God? We're going to search through the scriptures today to find answers to these questions when we come back. But let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we all agree as starting this today. I am praying for utterance to speak to your people boldly as your own oracle. That you will make my tongue as a pen of a radio writer. Praying for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, anointing that will teach us today, guide us today, enlighten us today. Dear Spirit of God, you are the only teacher, the greatest teacher. I pray that you will open the eyes, ears, hearts of everyone listening today. That you will give us revelation, knowledge, understanding. You will give to us what you want us to receive from today's teaching. You will let the glorious light of the gospel shine in our path today. That you will give us answers for now. Father God, we thank you because forever your word is settled in heaven. We thank you because you will always watch over your word to perform it. We always propose to be doers of your word, not hear us only, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in none of this I take any glory, but I give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Good friends, I welcome you today for another teaching. The title, like I said earlier, is Bible Simple Truth About Standing on the Promises of God. Before we proceed, I would like to read to you Romans chapter 10, verse 2, all the way to 4. Romans 10, verse 2, all the way to 4. Paul, writing to the saints at Rome, he says, Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they be in ignorance of the righteousness of God. And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law to righteousness to everyone who believes. So Paul is writing, he wrote to the saints at Rome about ignorance. The dangers of being ignorant about the word of God. You remember that the Jewish people received the law from Moses, the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, through, through the prophets, the prophet prophesied about Jesus Christ, the Messiah would be in their midst. But because of the ignorance of the word of God, of those prophecies, because they went about their own traditions, their own human doctrines, the things that they came up with, they forsook the word of God. And even though Messiah was in their midst, they missed his coming. Jesus Christ said, if you had known the things that are made for your peace, even you, at this your present day, but now they have escaped from you. Why? Because you do not know the time of your visitation. They missed it completely. So ignorance of the word of God, we can be very zealous about things, but when we have zeal without knowledge, it doesn't give us any help or solution at all. You can be very, very sincere in your heart, but you could be wrong. But how do we escape being wrong, being sincerely wrong, and missing out on the benefits of the word of God? How do we escape that? By going to the scriptures, searching it out ourselves, and see what the Bible says about it, every situation. So today, what we're going to be searching out today is, what does the Bible say about standing on the promises of God? That is going to be the topic for today. And I am so delighted that we're going to glean today to the word of God and we will be all profited by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
Baruch Hashem Adonai. So, let me dive into the teaching right away. You see, when you are born again, once you are born again, you become a child of God. Automatically. And you are now welcome into the beloved. You are welcome in the beloved. Which means the beloved is Jesus Christ. So, God welcomes you in the beloved. And you become a joint heir with Christ Jesus. These are all scriptures. And... Um, which means what Jesus has is what you got. Jesus takes you now as his own brother, even though he's your Lord and your Savior, but he is your brother as well, and the one who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding you, interceding for you every day from the hands of the evil one, the accuser of the brethren. So Jesus he, 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 he sits at the right hand of the Father, ne never to cease to make intercession for us. So these are the benefits. So the reason why we stand in the promises of God, which is made to us, is because they belong to us. They are legally ours. He made those promises to us. Someone who did the research said there are about more than 7,000 7, promises of God in the Bible. More than 7,000 of them. And every single one of them belongs to us. They are the promises that God has made to us. If God wasn't serious about them, he wouldn't put them in his word. So now, where can we find the promises of God? Where do we find the promises of God? We don't find them in, in the bulletin or in the novel or in a theology book written by some man, some theologian. We don't find them in the dictionary or on a website. No, we don't. We find the promises of God in the Word of God, which means in the Bible. That's why we find them. We find them in the Word of God, and but then they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. So all the promises of God, they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. It is in Christ Jesus that we can stand up and say, Yea, Amen. And then we lay hold and we take them. It's only in Christ Jesus. They are not fulfilled in men or in women or in prophets or in pastors or in teachers. They are not fulfilled in the government or in entities. But the Bible says they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. We find the promises in the word of God. But the fulfillment is now in Christ Jesus. Very important thing that you got to get hold of. Can we trust the promises of God? Because there's some people, because of prior experience, they are now in um they, they, they are skeptical about the promises of God because they said, I believed in the past, but it did not come to pass. So I don't know if I want to believe again. So do can we trust the word of God and his promises? Let us see what the Bible says about the word of God, which contains the promises of God. Let's go through the scriptures, because if we have confidence in his word, that his word, his word that he promised to us will come to pass, then we should not have any hesitation. Believing in the truth of the word of God. So can we trust the word of God that contains the promises of God? The Bible tells us forever your word is settled in heaven. Which means forever. It doesn't change. You know, the government can every time when you go to the Senate or the uh, House of Representatives, they have different mannerisms every day. So many men, so many minds, all the days, all the manners. So they come up with this law today and tomorrow they have to put an amend. So they will amend it and they will call it subtitle too. <laughs> Whatever they do in there, you know, I'm not criticizing them, but I'm telling you uh, in comparison with the word of God. But forever the word of God is settled. If the promises he gave to us is settled. It will not be changed. 
He doesn't wake up, uh, we, we don't wake up one morning and then we open our Bible and then we find out something has changed. What we read yesterday is no longer so. He has erased it and put something else in there. We don't. So forever means forever, for eternity. His promises are the same. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14, the Bible says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear him. They should fear before him. He says, whatever God does, it shall be what? Forever. You cannot add to it. You cannot subtract to it. The promises of God are eternally settled on his own part because he is the same yesterday, today, forever. He cannot change. Neither can he lie. So whatever the God, whatever God does, the Bible says it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it. And why does he do it that way? Men should fear before him. They should know that he is God, that he does not change. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. The universe that you and I live today is held together by the power of God's word, by the integrity of his word. Because it defies the law of electricity to have the forces in part together. If, if any time God, God, God's, God works change, any time his word changes, the universe will self-destroy itself. There will be a crash. Will be the end of it. But the forces are held together by the word of his power. That tells you how important it is to believe his own word. The heaven and the earth will pass away. But he says, my word will not pass away. The heaven and the earth. There will be a time when this element here will be dissolved with fervent heat. And there will be a new world and there will be a new heaven. The Bible tells us. He says, all oh, this we see right now, every one of them will disappear. They'll go away someday. But he says, his word, which created every one of them, will be in place. His word, which contains his own promises to us, will be in place. It will not disappear. Neither can it be contaminated or discounted or discredited. No, it will be the same. Everlasting word of God that would not fail. Baruch Hashem. Adonai, glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do it? Has he promised and he will not bring it to pass? So what he says, he says he will do. What he promises, he said he will do. So he's not a man. You know, men around you every now and then can even get out of there an agreement, legal agreement. They can find the best lawyer and get out of that agreement anytime they want to. They can promise you today just for you to come tomorrow and they tell you, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. This is how we are human beings. We can change anytime. We can decide to, to, to go the other way after we made our promises. But he says that he's not a man like us. He cannot lie. The things that he said he would do, he would do it. In his own word, in his, the promises that he's made to his own children, in Christ Jesus, they are fulfilled. Every single one of them, they are yea and amen in him. Baruch Hashem Adonai, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has exalted his word. Above all his name. Remember all the names God has in the Bible? Jehovah Tisikenu, Jehovah Jare, Jehovah Adonai, Yahweh. 
Elion. All of these names, he said his word is above every one of them. This is the authenticity of God's, of God's word. So we should trust in him. Remember, I'm asking you a question. Can we trust the word of God? Can we trust the promises that are found in his word? And this is why we're going to the scriptures. Searching the word of God to see if we can stand both in his own promises and lay hold of the things that are promised to us. So many things, both spiritual and physical. So many promises of God. But they got to be found in the word of God. Not a promise some men gave, but the promises that God has given to his children. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will watch over my word to perform it. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. I will watch over my word to perform it. Which means, if I say it, I will perform it. I will not decline. I will perform it. Friends, are you hearing what the word of God says? So we can stand boldly on the promises of God, knowing fully that he that has promised is able to fulfill, to keep those promises to his own children. It is his own will. He says, little flock, fear not, for it is the will, the good pleasure of the Father to give you the kingdom. Fear not. He will give you, it belongs to you. In Christ Jesus. There are about, there are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ that he fulfilled in his three and a half years life on earth. He fulfilled more than 300 prophecies about him. So if these pro prophecies were fulfilled by him, that tells you that the word of God can be fulfilled only if we will lay hold by faith and patience in the name of Jesus Christ. Your past testimonies will be a sure guide. You believed God, you stood on a promise and it, they came to pass or it came to pass. That testimony will always stay up your faith. It will become an anchor for future belief so that you can now stand even stronger on the promises of God. And we all have testimonies. If you look, search within, there are testimonies God has done for us. And if we can be honest to ourselves, we will find out that if he's done it before, <laughs> He's going to do it again. <laughs> Regardless of the situation surrounding your circumstance. Regardless of how impossible it may seem in the physical, in the sight of men. But remember that he's a God. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all things. Is there anything too hard for me? No, no, nothing, nothing. The creator of the heavens and the air, the stars and the moon. David says, when I... Consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man? The universe, the galaxies, as big as they are, unfathomable by man. But he created them all. The wind. Well, can you answer the question, where, do, where, where, where does the wind dwell? What is the dwelling place of the wind? Do you know the answer? Write me and tell me. But he is the one who has orchestrated all these things and created them through Jesus Christ. The Bible says he created everything through Jesus Christ and for him all things were created. Now, friends, we are going to change gears now. We have, I have spoken to you about the path of God, his own path, his own role. But that is one that we have to do because it's not only one side. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Two ends. 
God plays his own, we play our own. So now we're changing gears to talk about your own role. Don't think, don't think that it's gonna be something too much. No, 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 no. God wouldn't give you something or a responsibility that he knows you couldn't handle. He will be remiss if he does that. So the role that you got to play is what we're gonna dive into right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So put on your seatbelt and buckle it so very tight. We, we're gonna move on right now. <laughs> now, the promises of God we stand. There are two things, two criteria. There are two tools, two ways, two ways that we lay hold of the promises of God. Two things, only two. Friends, just two of them. If you're able to do two of them, you are fine. <laughs> it's not 20, it's not 30 of them, it's not 40 of them. We we can multitask, you know, this generation of multitask. People doing this and that and that and that at the same time. And they say, I am a multi, I can do a kind of, a kind of stuff at once. But there are only two now <laughs> he's asking you to do. And we can stand on the promises of God by faith and uh, patience. But I'm going to take one at a time. So I'm going to talk about faith now. Hear me very well so you don't miss this part. Because this is your own role, your own part to, to play. Faith will come. I want to tell you how you get faith. Because if I, I don't want to go further without telling you how you get faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that is Romans chapter 10 verse 17. The more <clears throat> you search the scriptures, the more you hear the scriptures, the more your faith will come up. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't get faith by praying. You don't get faith by fasting. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now faith will come by you hearing the word of God. Understand that there are two realms that the Bible talk about. The Bible talks about two realms, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. We live in the physical realm, but there is another realm that is a spiritual realm coexisting with the physical at the same time. They are operating at the same time. In parallel. Now, even though we cannot see the spiritual realm, but it is more authentic, more real than even the physical realm that you and I live in. It is a spiritual realm that created the physical realm. The spiritual created the physical. So, even though that we cannot see what is happening in the realm of the spirit. But by faith. When we find out what the Bible tells us that is happening in that realm. We will lay hold of it by faith. Even though we cannot see it. Even though we cannot touch it. Or feel it. But it is real. And so many things will happen for us in the realm of the spirit before they will be manifested in the spirit, in the physical realm. Are you hearing me, my friends? A lot of things will first take place in the realm of the spirit before you will see the manifest in the realm of the physical. But God is in the spiritual realm, so he sees it all. The Bible says he sees the end from the beginning. And he calls the things that be not as though they were. To us, they are not yet. But to him, he calls them because to him, they are already there. So he calls the things that be not as though they were. Our own, our own responsibility is to believe there is something happening there for our own good, for our own favor, even though we cannot see with our physical eyes. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal or temporary. But the things that are not seen are eternal. So sometimes, some people are led only by what they can see. And the Bible is telling us that the things that we see are just temporary. In a twinkle of an eye, they can change. That we should not pay attention to those circumstances. You are standing on the promises of God, but there are things that will come in your way, which the enemy will put them there, just to make you detour or try to defile your faith. To make you believe not. To say, these things, I don't think if they're going to happen, because it doesn't look like they're going to happen. So he's telling you here, he says, don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. What are the things which are not seen? What you found out in the word of God, what the Bible says about that situation. You cannot see them, but they are so. So these are the things the Bible says they are eternal, which means they will never change. It's just a matter of time and you will see them come to manifestation. In John chapter 11, verse 40, John chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus Christ is speaking to Martha, the sister of Lazarus. He says, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? If you would believe, you will see the glory of God. Which means one thing comes before the other. The first one is believe. And then it says, after you have believed, then you will see the manifestation. Are you, are you getting the connection here? In Jude, chapter 1, verse 3, the later part of that uh, verse, it says, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to all the saints. He says, Contend earnestly for that faith. Once delivered to all the saints. If it is something that comes automatically, it wouldn't tell you to contend for them. And it wouldn't use the word earnestly. So faith is your own portion, your own part to play. It doesn't come automatically. That's why the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. It is a fight. The enemy is trying to bring words and ideals and imaginations and the logic into your mind, trying to make you sway and become unbelief so that you don't believe in what the word of God says. But it is your own responsibility to stand bold and say, I stand on the promises of God. None of these things move me. I will receive that which I am Believe in God for. Are you hearing me, my friends? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let him that comes believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let him that comes believe, which means you gotta believe first. You gotta believe that God is able to do the thing that he said he would do. The promises that he's given to us that he is able to fulfill them. You got to believe. If you don't believe, then you will be wasting your time. It is so. That's how it is. We approach God by faith. He is a spiritual being. He's not a man. So we can relate only to him. We can relate only by faith to him. That's the only way we can approach God. The righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk writes, in 2.4, he says, the righteous, it is a style, a way of life. It's not something you visit today and then you, you live tomorrow. You don't vacation in faith. It is a lifestyle. You're going to live there every day, in every situation. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Now, let me talk to you about the enemies of your faith. 
enemies of your faith. Because when we are standing in faith, there is one enemy, Satan and his emissaries, his agents, his demons. They want to make sure that you, you they, they stop you from believing so that you don't receive. So that you don't receive that promise. So how does he do it? How does he do it? The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. It says, casting down imagination and every high thing which exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He tells us how to do it. Now, what is, what is he talking about here? The, 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 one of the ways that the enemy will approach you is imagination. That's why he says you're casting down imaginations. He will bring imaginations, pictures in your mind. He will whisper to your, in, in, to your ears that these things you believe in, they're not going to happen. Can't you see the handwriting on the wall? You think this will happen with all these things that you are seeing with your physical eyes? Now, these are the ways he will try to persuade you, to hinder you from believing, so that you will cast down your confidence. But, Bible tells you what to do. Immediately, those thoughts will come to your mind. He's the one that will put them there. They don't come from God. They come from the enemy. Immediately, they come up against that which you are believing God for. Cast them down. And every high thing that exalts itself above the word of God. The word of God is where you got your promise from. So anything that will be contrary to it, it's telling you to cast it down. Bring it to naught. You got the power within you to do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell you to do what you are not able to do. Friends, I'm going to talk to you now about patience. You know, I've spoke to you about faith. And now I'm going to talk to you about patience. Now, faith and patience, they work hand in hand. You cannot separate one from the other. As a matter of fact, when you come to the end, when you, when you, when, when you lose your patience, that's when you come to the end of your faith. Your faith wouldn't work without patience. So both of them are connected to each other. So while you are standing on the promises of God, you need to employ patience. Understand that God is walking behind the scene. Even though he's walking behind the scene, he is moving everything in the scene. He says the unseen. Now, there are some times we give God a time frame. God, I want this by tomorrow. I want it next week. I want it next month. God, why have I, have I have believed this for a long time? Why haven't I seen it? We give God a time frame. Even though we cannot see the things that are behind, the things that are in the realm of the Spirit, but we are giving God the time to do it. And He knows that there are things that He will grant to you at that moment that will imply, imply destruction unto you. He knows all of that. So, he wants to bring them to you when it's appropriate. All things will always work together for good. If you love God and you are called according to his purpose, the Bible tells us, he will make that which the enemy, even when the physical circumstances or the things that you can see, even when they portray that you have come to the end of the road, that those things that you believe is too late now. The Bible says that he will work these things for your good. He will take what the enemy has designed and orchestrated for your destruction. He will turn them around and he will dust them up and then he will turn them for your own good. So that's why you got to be patient. You got to be patient. In the presence of the Lord Almighty, if you are standing in his presence, if you are willing to stand there, you are not going to be standing for a long time. Because the promises of God are in him. Yea, 
and in him. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me read to you Hebrew chapter 6 verse 12. Hebrew chapter 6 verse 12. And the Bible says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who to faith and patience inherit the promises. That you do not be lazy. That's what that, bo- that word means, sluggish. But imitate those who through what? Faith and patience. Both of them go to- they go together. Both go together. He says they inherit the promises. That's the way you got to inherit the promises of God. You got to mix them up together. You first of all employ the faith of God in it. Faith that is found in his word. And then you got to be patient knowing that God is walking behind the scene. And nothing is too late for him. He will always be there on time. Even when you think that every hope is lost and crushed. But he shows up and he says, son, here I am. I have come for you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36. The Bible says, for you have need for endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may inherit the promise. Cast not your confidence. For he has a greater recompense of reward. For you have need for patience. So that after you have done the will of God, you may inherit the promise. Cast not your confidence. Your faith. Imply patience. For it has a greater recompense of reward. That after you've done the will of God, you will inherit now the promise. You see that? The promise come. It will come. It will come. The Bible says it will come. After you have walked in faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Proverbs chapter 24 verse 10, the Bible says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Are you hearing me? It's talking about you having the kind of faith that we call unshakable faith. Faith that cannot be moved regardless of what it sees. If you have this kind of faith, in the day of adversity, it says, your strength will not be considered as small. You will not faint that day. When you have an unshakable faith, faith that is built upon only in the word of God, faith that is not ruled by physical circumstances, that cannot be manipulated by hearing of the words of people or by the seeing of the eyes. No! Unshakable faith! Faith that stands bold. And say, I will never be dismayed because the Lord will say that he will be with me. That if I go through the water, they will not overflow me. Through the, if I go through the fire, it will not consume me. You, you, you got this faith in you. And then you stand bold. The kind of faith that Paul saw uh, uh, on Timothy. The same faith that was in Timothy's grandma and Timothy's mom. Same faith. That's what he's saying here. Now, let me give you examples, my friend. In the Bible, I'll give you two examples about those who stood on the promises of God. Regardless, they stood there (laughs) and they overcame. (laughs) Peter, remember? Peter, Herod the Agrippa, King Herod the Agrippa, one. He already laid hold of uh, James. He put him to death. Now he got hold of Peter, waiting for the festival, the feast to be over, so they can bring him out to the people and kill him as well. King Agrippa. But at the night before Peter's execution was to happen, he was sound asleep. The Bible tells us. Who could be sound asleep? Knowing that tomorrow they're going to cut off your head. (laughs) And you are sound asleep. (laughs) Have you asked yourself that question? How could he be sound asleep? 
An angel has to wake he, angel came and woke him up, smooth him. <laughs> Which means he was sound asleep. He probably maybe even be snoring. <laughs> Why was that so? Because he stood on the promise of, of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus tell to Peter? Remember, after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he told Peter that when you were young, you dressed up yourself. You went wherever you wanted to go. But when you get old, you will stretch forth your hands and someone will take you to places that you don't want to go. That's what Jesus Christ told Peter. And the Bible tells us this, he talked about the kind of death that he was going to die. So Peter knew that he was going to die as an old man, old man, old man, not young. So he was sound asleep. He, he stood on the promise Jesus Christ made to him. He said, I'm going to get me some sleep. I'm going to even snow here. <laughs> they can do what they want to do, but I know that I'm not dying tomorrow. <laughs> and the man went to sleep. <laughs> second example, my friend. Let me give you the second example. Abraham. Remember when God asked him to offer his son Isaac? He did. He knew God promised him that through your seed, through your offspring, he says, through your seed, shall Isaac be called. Through Isaac, I'm sorry, through Isaac, shall your seed be called. So he's not talking about here the, the physical descendant of Abraham. He's talking about those who will be the children of promise. The children of promise. To Isaac shall your seed be called. So Abraham, standing on the promises of God, he knew that if he kills Isaac, God is going to raise him from the dead somehow. So that was why he was so bold wanted to sacrifice Isaac because he stood on the promises of God. Now, the, another important thing is when you are standing on the promises of God, very, very important that you give thanks regardless of the circumstance, regardless of how long it has taken. Bible says, you know, all things give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are not giving thanks to God because of the situation we find ourselves, because of the negative events happening at that moment, because of the uh, disadvantage. We're not giving God praise or thanks because of those things, because they, those things don't come from God. But we are giving God thanks in spite of those situations. Knowing fully that God is walking behind the scene. That even though he's walking behind the scene, he's moving everything that is in the scene. That he will take that which enemy has meant for evil and turn it out for your good. So you give thanks to God. You do not go by the physical manifestations, what you can see or hear or feel. But you are believing God, knowing that he that promised is able to keep. Speaking boldly on this issue, Paul says, he says, I know, he says, none of these things move me, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He is so bold, standing on the promises of God. He says, I know whom I have believed. I am not moved by what I see, what I hear, or the things that are surrounding me. No, no, no. He says, I know whom I have believed. He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He is able. He that calls you is able. He that began a good work in you will continue to perform it in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he will always perfect those things that pertain to you. That's what the Bible says. So you give thanks. You give God praise. Lift up your holy hands and give God praise. Father, I thank you. Even in this situation, I know that all things work together for my good. I will not be moved. 
For I trust you and I have confidence in your word. I know you are not a man that you should lie to me. I found your promise in your word, O oh Lord, and there am I. I'm going to give you thanks and praise knowing fully that they will manifest. Blessed be your holy name. You give thanks to God in every situation, regardless. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Peter. I'm sorry. Remember Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I believe. Writing to Timothy, he said, all in my first defense, in my first defense, I believe he was talking about his defense to um, uh, 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 Caesar Nero in, uh, at Rome when he was uh, there in prison. He says, in my first defense, all the people forsook me, but God stood by me and strengthened me that through his strength I'm able to preach the gospel and the Gentiles heard it. He says, God stood by me and strengthened me. There are things when you stand on them, the promises of God. You don't tell people about it. Why? Because they're going to forsake you. They are going to make caricature of you. They're going to think that you are beside yourself. They're going to think that you are insane. They're not going to believe with you. So you don't speak, you don't share those things with people, of people who don't believe especially. But you're going to know that God is standing by you and he's going to strengthen you. And when the manifestation comes, it's going to be for his own glory and for your own good. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good friends, I have come to the end of today's program. If you're listening to me, wherever you're listening from. If you're not yet born again, which means you're not yet a Christian. You may be a member of a church, but you are not yet born again. Very, very possible. So many members of churches are not born again. Why? Because they don't understand what it means to be born again. They think that when you become a church member, you register and become a member, and then you, you are baptized in water. It means salvation. But that's not what the Bible says. To be born again means that you put aside your own efforts, your own goodness, your own merits, your own righteousness. Put them aside now. And then you turn around and you depend 100% on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 100%. What he did for you. You believe that he is the son of God. He died for your sins. He washed away all your sins through his death and resurrection. And you believe that God raised him up from the dead on the third day. And then you ask him to come into your life and become your Lord and your Savior. And you start a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. So if you haven't done this, now is an opportunity. There is no other way that you can be saved or go into heaven or enter the kingdom of God. If not through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Are you hearing me? I'm going to say it again. There are no other ways. Because Jesus said so. I didn't say so. So don't write me and say, why did you say so? I have not spoken that. But Jesus did. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. It's a definite article. The way, he is the only way. And then he was speaking to Nicodemus. He says, he, unless a man, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no other name under heaven that is given among men whereby you must be saved, but the name of Jesus. That's what the Bible says in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. So, don't assume that because you belong to one religion or the other, means that you are going to heaven. It will be a pure deception. Ignorance gone on rampage. That is why I'm sharing the good news to you today. Telling you the way to heaven. The only way. There is no other way. The Bible says that if you reject Jesus Christ, you also rejected the Father Almighty. 
But if you acknowledge Jesus Christ and you receive him, you also will have the Father. You cannot reject one and get the other. If you don't believe in Jesus, you have no business with the Father. That is what the Bible says. And you don't want to come to Jesus Christ based on your own good works, on your merits. Such things, they have to be a byproduct of you being born again. You come to Jesus just as you are, in emptiness of yourself. You come to him depending on what he did for you. Don't depend on your own goodness, for they will not save you. For all have seen and come short of the knowledge of, of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. Our own righteousness are future lives in the presence of God Almighty. You cannot be saved by your own works. But blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. He did the whole thing for you. He went to the cross. He died, crucified for our sins. God raised him from the dead. And now all he's asking you is to receive that which he has done for you as a free gift by faith. Alone, faith alone. You don't receive it by, by, by works or by actions or by fasting or by praying. You receive it by faith. It's a free gift. The Bible says the day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. I stand at the door and I knock. Jesus Christ is saying, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come in and I will eat with him and he will also eat with me. It is a choice you got to make. When he knocks at the door, you got to be the one to open and invite me. He will not force you to do it because he created us as free moral agents. We got our own choices to make. But our choices are limited while we are here on earth. If you don't make the right choice when you are here on earth, one will be made for you when you leave this planet. And you don't want that to be made for you. The choice here now is for you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will be granted eternal life. You become born again. You will have access to heaven when you die. Remember, we cannot live here forever. The time is very short. Even if you live a hundred years, it will come by very quick. It is estimated that about 100,000 people, 155,000 people, die every day in this world. Why did they go? Where did they go? Depends on the choice they made while they're on earth. If they receive Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, they will be in heaven with God. But if they rejected him, they will be in hell. There is a place that is called hell. And I'm going to warn you, it is a real place. You don't want to go there. It is a place where there is a fire burning with, like a lake burning with fire and brimstone. You don't want to be in that place. In as much as I've given you the good news about the kingdom of God and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as a free gift, there is a place called hell, a place of torment and torture, that if you do not make this choice, it will become too late and you get to spend eternity there. It is a free gift. The Bible says, buy, come, buy and eat. He that has no money. It is a free gift. You buy and you eat. You take. There are people here, they are all, all they are all about is the things that will perish. The Bible tells us to labor, not for the thing that perishes. He said, for the thing that perish, don't labor for them. But he says, labor for the things that endure unto everlasting life, for the meat that endure unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give to you. If you're a billionaire here on earth, when you die, you're going to take nothing with you. For you were born with nothing and we will take nothing with us when we live here. But what about the place you're going to spend eternity? What are you doing about it? Are you all about your own things that perish here? Houses and cars and businesses and fortune and fame and name? All these things will go away in the twinkle of an eye. But there is a place where you're going to spend your eternity. And this is the place that I'm calling you today. To hear the gospel. And make this place your eternal home. Heaven. That's what it's called. 
Jesus says, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides in him. The wrath of God will abide on those who don't believe. He says, if you believe not that I am he, I am the Messiah. He says, you will die in your sins. So friends, I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer with all your heart and mean it, you're going to be right now regretted. And if you will die, you will be in heaven. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I'm now born again. I'm a child of God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. My sins are washed away. I have now eternal life. And I give you all the glory, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good friends, if you say that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. You are now a child of God, a Christian. There is a subsequent experience called the infilling of the Holy Spirit, evident by speaking with other tongues. If you go to my iCarve on YouTube, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian, that's the name of the channel. You will find a teaching there called uh, Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. I believe this, uh, um, not uh, a teaching, is a video. I believe that this video will help you, guide you, Throw light. Give you what you need to understand by being filled with the Spirit of God and speaking with other tongues. Now that you are born again, you are a baby Christian. So it is very important, very, very important that you find a good church where they teach the Word of God and become a member. And buy a Bible so that you can read the Word of God and grow in your faith. Because faith will come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Peter says, desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So that Satan don't take advantage of you. So that you will be stronger every day in the faith. Fighting the good fight of faith. And keeping the promises of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us financially and through their prayers. To reach other people at no cost to them. If you want to be part of this soul winning, if you want to be this uh, part of this partnership, please go to our website. It is www.kuim.org. And there is a donation button where you can securely give your donations. Remember, it is only those who hear the word of God and put them in practice that are the ones that will have the benefits of the word of God manifesting in their lives. As always, there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Mangrada Baruch Ste Krede Eske Unguru Paret. Alawaja Kalala Brakim Guru Ste Kudu.